So, good day everyone. Here are a few notes for your reading of Darwin's Origin of Species and Descent of Man. As I mentioned on our call, it's difficult to take excerpts from the Origin of Species because it's structured as one extended and sustained and unified argument, which is one of the things I think is most interesting and actually nice to read about it. In a sense, this structure is not unlike Darwin's view of nature itself, a view he derives from Charles Lyell's Principles of Geology of a theory of uniformity and gradualism, and Darwin's view of life as being genealogically related and united in our descent from a common ancestor, just as the chapters of this book flow from one into the other. I think you'll see a very different style when we get to the descent of man as we find in Origin of Species. Now, Charles Lyell was a mentor and friend of Darwin. In fact, Lyell's Principles of Geology was one of the books in Darwin's little library on the Beagle. In it, Lyell argues that contrary to biblical viewpoints, the Earth is quite old, and certainly more than the approximate 6,000 years given by some theologians both then and now. Not only is the Earth much older than is portrayed in biblical and theological sources, but the changes in the Earth are gradual. Gradualism and uniformity are the code words here. The same processes that shaped the world in the past are still in action today. There's also this idea of natural non facta saltum, nature does not move in leaps. This is the basis of the idea of gradualism, and it was Lyell's phrase. You'll find it scattered eight times, in fact, throughout the origin of species and in later writings by Darwin. Gradualism, as Lyell sets it out, stood in sharp contrast to the dominant view during his time, which was most famously associated with the French naturalist Georges Cuvier. Despite the many critiques of Cuvier that we'll touch on later, he introduced a number of concepts and routes of study that would become important in situating Darwin's work. But don't get me wrong, there was one fundamental part where Darwin and Cuvier differed, and it was over gradualism versus Cuvier's idea of revolutions of the globe. Because at the center of the disagreement here is the question of whether species are created, designed, fixed and unchanging in their places in nature, or whether species change or transform over time. If you can answer this, then you understand the meaning of the diversity of, the diversity of life on our planet. And if you understand that, then you understand the meaning of life, really. This is not what we might today call an academic question. The context of natural history is the context of colonialism, imperialism, and slavery, all of which manifest and intensify the drive to catalog, classify, and dominate nature. Cuvier's theory of revolutions of the earth was ironically an attempt to establish a foundation in natural history for the fixity of species and a version of the biblical story of the flood, a story that, of course, predates the Judeo-Christian version. Cuvier recognized that the geological strata he observed near Paris were a record of past times, that the layers were distinct, and that some contained fossils which exist only in one layer, while other fossils could be found scattered through many layers, though few lasted into the most recent strata. Only recently, in fact, during his time, had, had, and partly because of his work, had fossils come to be seen as something like the remains of plants and animals, and not monstrosities, fallen angels, or, this is the term that was used, abortions of the earth. Cuvier used his extensive knowledge of comparative anatomy, a field he helps create, to distinguish the fossils as different or similar species, etc. One thing that was clear to him was that humans only appear in the most recent strata. To account for this absence of some fossils in later strata and the appearance of new creations, he suggested that some species had become, to use his term, extinct. Now, extinction presents a problem or two, or maybe a few more than that. 
first, of all, though at least for Cuvier, uh, first, how would a decrease in the number of species result in the diversity that we see today? And another related problem that's theological and philosophical is why would a created, designed, and fixed species become extinct? Was it imperfect? And if you so, or if you think that it was imperfect, it seems that there goes your idea of a divine creator or designer. Could one possibly find a way to reconcile extinction with creation in a way that was consistent with the emerging evidence from geology, the fossil record, comparative anatomy, and contemporary observations? Well, the answer that Cuvier came up with was pretty ingenious, and let me try to summarize it for you, though remember I said to beware of all summarizers. Just as we have revolutions of society, so too does the Earth undergo revolutions or catastrophes. The different strata document different catastrophes during which the Earth was overturned, the oceans rose, something supported as well by the fact that we find marine fossils far inland and far upland from today's oceans. Extinctions are the result of these catastrophes. The record of at least six geological periods could be found in the geological strata that, the, that Cuvier found outside of, of Paris. And now, this is the real reconciliation here. Not only do geology and comparative anatomy confirm these catastrophes and mass extinctions, but so too does the Bible, he says. The biblical account of the flood, he argues, is a semi-historical record of the most recent catastrophe. Moreover, the biblical account could now be reconciled with slavery, colonialism, and the domination of others. Thus, Cuvier preserved the biblical account and the fixity of species while recognizing the ancient age of the earth and the extinction of species. It's a curious blend of continuity and discontinuity in his work. Our world and the species in it have been fixed since then, he said, since the last flood. And so too, he will say, have the races of humans been fixed since the flood. Let's step backwards for a minute, or step back for a minute, and look at the work and the importance of the work of Carl Linnaeus, which was, he's really Carl Linnaeus, but he wanted to sound more Roman, so he changed it to Linnaeus. Um, this work is especially important for understanding the debate on the species question that Darwin was intervening into with the origin of species. In Linnaeus' system of nature, he established the binomial system of classification that we use today, and he did this in order to be able to accurately catalog and classify all of nature. The importance of the task was only magnified for him by the new varieties of plants and animals that imperialist travelers and his own students, known historically as his disciples, were bringing back to Europe. In order to do this work of cataloging and classifying, there is required an assumption of the fixity of species. The book of nature had already been written, and there could be no new chapters, or at least not until the next catastrophe, Cuvier would say. It's important to note that both Linnaeus and Cuvier after him were convinced of the fixity of humans into separate types or races. Linnaeus is, in fact, the first to place humans in the natural world, and also where we first find our modern conceptions of race being articulated. And if we look at the second and tenth editions of the system of nature, we can actually see the development of this idea of race within, I'm sorry, within Linnaeus's own work. In the second edition from 1740, you see this very simple um, classification of humans. Their humans are distinguished by the fact that we know ourselves. Now, in this, there are four separate varieties of human, he says. There's the white Europeans, the red Americans, the yellow Asians, and the black Africans. There's really, this is the entire description of humans that you find in this edition. 
if we go to the 10th edition, we see a much more detailed and not just a division and classification based upon physical attributes, but also cultural attributes as well. For instance, we see here that Europeans are distinguished by being white, sanguine, and muscular. Their hair is flowing and long, their eyes are blue, their behavior is gentle, acute, and inventive. They cover themselves with close vestments and they're governed by laws. But if we go to the others, we see that they cover themselves with loose garments as opposed, and they're ruled by opinions, as he says, of Asians. Or he looks at Africans and says that the women are without shame and that they lactate profusely. They, their behavior is crafty, indolent, and, and negligent. They anoint themselves with grease, and they are governed by whim and caprice. So, in the course of about 30 years, we go from a, a very sch schematic idea of race and racial difference in Linnaeus to a very detailed one in his works. In his own work, Cuvier also tried to establish the fixity of humans in, for example, his dissection of Bargetman or his study of the fixity of mummified sacred ibises found in Egyptian tombs, which, when he compared them with contemporary specimens, showed that they had not changed at all. He then compared the fixity of Negro types found in Egyptian inscriptions with contemporary Negro types and found that they, too, had not changed in the 6,000 years since the last catastrophe. And so what does Darwin take from all of this? First, he takes it as a confirmation that the Earth is, as Lyell argues, quite old, subject to gradual, continuous, and general transformations. Secondly, that humans are a part of nature. Third, that the species that exist today have not always existed, and that earlier species have become extinct, along with Lyell's insight that the same processes in nature exist today, uniformism, and that we ourselves are subject to them. What he does not adopt, the notion of a creator or of a designer or design, intelligent or otherwise. Second, the fixity of species, whether it's the fixity of all species, or more specifically, the fixity of human species or human races as species. And third, that races constitute separate species with separate origins, or polygenism. Now at this point, the problem becomes understanding and explaining change over vast periods of time, and how this gives rise to the diversity of nature. The answer came to Darwin as he voyaged on the Beagle, and later as he went through his notes and collections. As he says in the introduction to the origin, it, be it came to him because of his encounters with the inhabitants of South America. Now, I think this has a double meaning here, for on the one hand, Darwin is referring to the flora and fauna of South America, but on the other, he's also referring to the humans as well, and most importantly, the slavers and enslaved, the first peoples and the colonizers. From these encounters that he has comes his intervention into the species question. Note to the title of the work, the singular origin and not the origins. It anticipates the genealogical continuity that animates his argument all the way through. And note as well the complete title. We are dealing with races, and yet one will find very few mentions of humans in the work. For that, we will have to wait until his expression of emotions in man and animals and the descent of man. I will note the importance of slavery in all of this in the next broadcast, but a bit more about this week's readings. This chapter, or these chapters, are key to understanding Darwin's theory, but also in understanding how he presented it to the public and his fellow naturalists. First, the struggle for existence, out of which we can distinguish the workings of natural selection in generating the variety of species through the preservation of favorable characteristics, as Darwin might say.
Consider as you read these two chapters how Darwin introduces an ecological perspective on the relations of living beings, something not to be found in the work of his contemporaries. The tangled bank is in fact his metaphor for nature itself. Here is this quote from the conclusion. It is interesting to contemplate an entangled bank clothed with many plants of many kinds, with birds singing on the bushes, with various insects flitting about, and with worms crawling through the damp earth, and to reflect on these elaborately constructed forms so different from each other and dependent on each other in so complex a manner have all been produced by laws acting around us. He also talks about what happened to him in Brazil, too. And I'm putting up a quote for you so you can see that this idea of the entangled bank has its inspiration in his observations uh, at Down House on his sand walk, which he created for his daily strolls, and from his encounters in Brazil. His description of the Brazilian jungle immediately after he had fled, witnessing the brutality of a slaver he was powerless to prevent, has many re similarities to the later metaphor of the entangled bank. But this is not yet biology or ecology. These will come after Darwin facilitates a shift from cataloging and classification towards the study of nature as the study of life. It is life itself and many varieties and species which unites all in the struggle to exist. Species, varieties, and individuals struggle to live. And notice that struggle for existence is used interchangeably with the phrase struggle for life. Here's a key passage from Darwin. I should premise that I use the term struggle for existence in a large and metaphorical sense, including dependence of one being on another, and including, which is more important, not only the life of the individual, but the success in leaving progeny. Two canine animals in a time of Darth may be truly said to struggle with each other, which shall get food and live. But a plant on the edge of a desert is said to struggle for life against the drought, though more properly it should be said to be dependent on the moisture. A plant which annually produces a thousand seeds, of which on average only one comes to maturity, may be tr more truly said to struggle with the plants of the same and other kinds which already clothe the ground. The mistletoe is dependent on the apple and a few other trees, but can only in a far-fetched sense be said to struggle with these trees, for if too many of these parasites grow on the same tree, it will languish and die. But several seedling mistletoes growing close together on the same branch may more truly be said to struggle with each other. As the mistletoe is disseminated by birds, its existence depends on the birds, and it may metaphorically be said to struggle with other fruit-bearing plants in order to tempt birds to devour and thus disseminate its seeds rather than those of other plants, and these several senses which pass into each other. I use, for convenience sake, the general term of struggle for existence. It's a very important passage in Darwin. It is actually, in these, as he says, a large and metaphorical sense that he uses the term. Now, these past and future struggles are not preordained or determined. The variation is the result of chance and contingency, not progress or teleology. Darwin's a materialist, and chance and contingency, contingency are for him, as we'll find out for Darwin, essential aspects of nature itself. So let me defer on Darwin's use of Malthus and his decision to use Herbert Spencer's phrase survival of the fittest for the next time, though you might notice that the phrase survival of the fittest does not appear in the first through the fourth editions of The Origin of Species. But let me finish by emphasizing that in this struggle for life, which is indeterminate and intermittent, we can discern how species are transformed gradually over time by the preservation of slight differences, which come to dominate in a population through the action of natural selection.
Here's the uh, perhaps essential quote on natural selection that you'll find in the chapters to, that you're reading for this week. As man can produce and certainly has produced a great result by his methodical and unconscious means of selection, what may not nature affect? Man can act only on external and visible characteristics. Nature cares nothing for appearances, except insofar as they may be useful to any being. She can act on any inter she can act on every internal organ, on every shade of constitutional difference, on the whole machinery of life. Man selects only for his own good, nature only for that of the being which she tends. Every selected character is fully exercised by her, and the being is placed under well suited conditions of life. Under nature, the slightest difference of structure or constitution may well turn the nicely balanced scale in the struggle for life, and so be preserved. How fleeting are the wishes and efforts of man, how short his time, and consequently how poor will his products be compared with those accumulated by nature during whole geological periods. So, in the origin of species, the emphasis is on natural selection. In Darwin's domestication of animals, the attention is on artificial selection. And as we'll find in the, the Descent of Man, the emphasis changes to sexual selection. In the origin, Darwin mentions sexual selection as, quote, a struggle between males for the possession of the females. But ten years later, in The Descent of Man, he describes sexual selection as being more a matter of females selecting males, and thus females driving variation and, and adaptation, especially in social animals like humans. So that's all for now. I left the mountain of items and details aside, but I hope this gives you a start on your reading. And as you read, think about the impressions and ideas that you had about Darwin coming into this week's work, and think about Darwin's descriptions of nature, of life, and of the workings of chance. So, have a good and safe week, and I'll see you on Thursday. Cheers.